Good morning students, welcome to Sharad Chandra IAS Academy Daily Current Affairs Analysis So today we are going to discuss the current affairs of 19th April 2022 So the topics which we are going to discuss are First, about the S-400 missile system in India Second is about ammonia found in river Ebono Third, about the Interstate River Water Disputes Act of 1956. Fourth is about Sir Chotu Ram. Fifth is about the Poison Field Defense. So these are the five topics of the day. So coming to the first topic about S-400 missile system in India. So this S-400 Triumph missile system the context for this is they have arrived means equipment and simulations have arrived from Russia so uh, when this particular agreement was made in 2018 okay so in 2018 the, there was an agreement between India and Russia to acquire the S-400 Triumph missile system so when the agreement was made in 2018, uh, it was expected, the delivery was expected in 2021 itself. But however, because of the COVID situations and because of Ukraine-Russia war, okay, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine crisis and uh, the delivery has been delayed, has been delayed. But however, if you see the 2018 agreement, uh, when this S-400 Triumph missile system was being delivered, what means the agreement was made between India and Russia. The US did not, means US was obviously, uh, it was against the defense agreement between the Russia and India. So, by using its Khatsa Act, by using its Khatsa Act, so if you see the Khatsa Act, here is the Khatsa Act. So this act is nothing but countering America's adversaries through sanctions act. So despite despite the threat of sanctions from the US, India signed the agreement. Almost it is a six a 5.4 billion US dollar agreement with Russia to acquire the S-400 missile system. So it is a clear clear indication that we are a sovereign country we don't fear either for us sanctions or russian sanctions or chinese sanction or for any other sanctions when to meet the national interests it is a clear example so coming to the, what is this cards act they will uh, they will apply some sanctions on the economic terms if suppose any country buys the equipment from russia korea iran so what is the purpose of S-400? What, first of all, what is what is uh, this S-400? We will see what is this S-400. So S-400 is nothing but it is a surface-to-air missile, surface-to-air missile developed by Russia. So it is a surface-to-air missile and it will use the modern long-range, modern long-range surface-to-air missile, and it is considered very uh, advanced mission, very advanced. Uh, missile system even compared to third third is a uh, missile system developed by usa it is terminal high altitude air defense system so this us developed terminal high altitude air defense system when you consider this because us offered this to india but uh, we opted for s400 triumph instead of third we opted for s400 triumph because it is said that this is more uh, stronger and more efficient one when compared to the third so this uh, system like S-400 can engage uh, the aerial targets because it is surface to air missile. So if suppose uh, if this is Indian territory, if any target is coming, means if any missile is coming from the, uh, any missile or any bombardment comes from the air, then this surface to air missile will obstruct that, will destroy that particular attack. So all the whether that is aircraft or unmanned aerial vehicle or ballistic or cruise missile, whatever it is, if it is within the range of 400 kilometers, and uh, it is if it is the range of 400 kilometers, and if it is uh, in the distance of up to 30 kilometers itself, 
the, the this particular S400 triumph will engage, will destroy that particular uh, the coming incoming whatever the missile or aircraft or whatever it is. Okay, it can track more than 100 airborne targets and engage six of them simultaneously. So why it is more important to India? Because if you see on uh, on one side, on one side China, there is Chinese threat is there to India. On the other side, we have threat of Pakistan. So there is a need. Sometimes the need arises to go for a uh, two-side war. Okay, two-front war. So that's the reason why we must have such equipment like S-400 advanced equipment. Knowing the fact that China uh, already acquired this S-400 Triumph. Okay, China brought this S-400 Triumph from Russia way back in 2018 itself. They made agreement to 2015 delivery. Delivery was done in 2018. So after the delivery was done to China, we started doing an agreement with Russia in 2018. So that's why uh, we have to, it is crucial for the counter attacks in both the fronts, whether it is uh, both fronts from Pakistan and China side. So, <coughs> so without even fearing for cards, we have brought this technology into India. Why? Because what happens if, uh, of course, see, remember, do remember that by buying this S400, so we bought the S400, but the card wa cards uh, was not applied on India because of our uh, good relations with US. Uh, and we diversified as we diversified our uh, uh, defense equipment buying from different countries earlier we used to buy only from russia but later upon we decrease uh, we increase our uh, defense from us and uh, israel so we diversified so so even though means uh, because of the good india indo us relations the cards or rules are not applied on US, uh, india even though we bought s400 what is this cards? You will see the major purpose of this particular act is to destabilize the Iran, Russia, and North Korean defense economy. So through the measures like uh, this was bill was passed in 2017. So if anyone buys any defense equipment from Iran, Russia, North Korea, then this cards will be applied on that particular country where sanctions are imposed, which affects the business of that particular target country. So what type of sanctions, loans will not be given, ex uh, assistance of Exim Bank, Export Import Bank will not be provided and uh, business with the US will be completely shut down, visas for the family members will not be given for such countries. Okay, So these are the Im sanctions imposed on the countries which will do the deals with Russia, South Korea, sorry North Korea and Iran. Next, <coughs> as far as uh, India and Russia defense cooperation is considered. If you see, defense cooperation is very important for Indo-Russia relations. If you see Indo-Russia partnership and Indo-Russia defense relation, uh, relations in particular, defense is very important part of it. Because earlier we used to buy all our equipment from Russia only and later upon we diversified it to US, Israel, uh, Israel and uh, Russia. So major, major these three countries. So we have very good defense relations with Russia uh, in the past as well as present. And uh, still, still today, even though we are buying many equipment from US and Israel, uh, Russia is the dominant or almost, uh, if you see, 86 percent of all our equipment, defense equipment, foreign defense equipment, has been imported from Russia. So, particularly in post Cold War, post Cold War period, uh, the engagement to, with Russia to some extent decreased, and the engagement with the US increased. But still, we have very good strategic partnership in defense sector with Russia. Uh, for example, India approved MIG-29 and SU-30 MKI or AK-203 rifle contracts, KA-226 T utility helicopters. So. Uh, such uh, way we can say that 86 percentage of equipment weapons are for our Russian origin only okay so <coughs> we do because what if you see the advantage of defense relations with Russia vis-a-vis -vis US is Russia will transfer the technology that is very important whereas US only will sell will sell 
the equipment okay they will sell the equipment they will sell the defense whatever it is but they will not transfer the technology they will not uh, like uh, what can see there is, there is no much cooperation and joint manufacturing is not there but whereas russia is providing transfer of technology and also joint manufacture where we can learn how to manufacture such defense so joint manufacturing is very important concept here for example brahmos cruise missile is produced both with cooperation of russia and india so they both cooperate with each other and produce i mean uh, production of brahmos cruise missile is a good example and joint exercises like indira where our uh, tri services will participate and if you see the ins vikramaditya the only aircraft carrier in india that is also from russian origin and uh, chakra 2 the nuclear attack submarine is also from russian so if you see air force iaf su 30 mk army t90 t70 battle tanks so there was a long and strong defense relation long and strong defense relation between between india and russia so today if you see the strategic silence maintained by india in case of all the resolutions against the russia in uno regarding the russian ukraine war so the strong relations with russia is one of the reason so in the indian interests right so moving on to the next topic <coughs> the second topic is about the ammonia so it is about the ammonia present found in the river yamuna here yeah. coming to this topic if you see this is regarding the water pollution the topic is about the water pollution so ammonia the context is ammonia levels in yamuna river were remained very high creating the water supply interruptions in the delhi and the con see if you see the ammonia content it is 7.4 parts per million which is very 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 high and almost seven times of what is means the tolerable limit is only 0.5 maximum maximum tolerable limit in the drinking water is only 0.5 parts per million according to the bureau of indian standards according to the bureau of indian standards so according to the bureau of indian standards the maximum amount of ammonia allowed is only 0.5 ppm so uh, okay if it is increases if it is increases it can be like one if it is 1 ppm if it is 1 ppm then the treatment plants can treat it delhi jal boards water treatment plant can treat this that means they can Uh, remove the ammonia and they can make it less than 0.5 ppm and they can supply to the taps tap water okay so they can provide as the tap water to the public if it is uh, less than mean if it is like 1 ppm we can go for water treatment plants and there we can decrease the nitro uh, ammonia content and we can supply to the household but if you see the content now it is 7.4 ppm why because this is this makes it difficult even for the treatment plants to supply the water and to do the treatment of I mean, to decrease the ammonia content in the drinking water so if you see what is this ammonia and why it is dangerous i mean what are the uh, why are we not So why are we saying that it should not be present in the drinking water what are the negative aspects of this presence of ammonia in the drinking water if you see the ammonia is nothing but the uh, it two elements are there hydrogen and nitrogen the formula of ammonia is nh3 okay so ammonium is nh4 so ammonium hydroxide is nh4oh so so all these are the ammonia I mean consisting substances where the ammonia is a colorless gas actually it is in the gaseous form it is a colorless gas and used in the used as industrial chemical okay it is used in the manufacturing industrial chemical so used in fertilizers polymers fibers and other compounds so is it a natural occurring or a man made it is naturally occurring so it is a naturally occurring in environment so uh, if organic waste organic waste present in the land 
so this is organic waste present in the land so there are several bacteria which will uh, what can you say is which will convert the atmospheric nitrogen atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia and ammonium products so that so that this can be utilized by the plants utilized by the plants right utilized by the plants so they are uptaken by the plants so this is okay so because we are telling it as an organic waste matter and uh, also may be find in the ground or surface water through the so it is a naturally occurring one but what is happening it is it is naturally occurring one and it is required for the plants ammonia and ammonium products are actually required for the products required for the plants here what we are more concerned about is the degradation of this organic material naturally occurring and result for the degradation of our uh, environment how because the this ammonia is being released from the industrial effluents and contamination by sewage so these two what are the reasons for the contamination so the contamination of ground water as well as surface water will occur because of this industrial effluents and sewage contamination so industries are releasing the ammonia and sewage untreated sewage from the households is also consists of ammonia if ammonia content of the water exceeds 1 ppm it is very dangerous for the fish will be get poisonous if long term water consumption which uh, 1 ppm then it injures the human internal organs as well so the effect is like how how this happens and why this happens it is very simple if you see if the content of ammonia nh3 increases in water in water bodies what happens is this ammonia this ammonia will react with the oxygen present in the water okay so will react to come to form the other compounds like nitro uh, what is it nitrous oxide and so on okay nitrous oxide and so on it will form but however with this reaction with the presence of ammonia in the water as this ammonia reacts with the oxygen the amount of oxygen in the water decreases therefore the biological oxygen demand increases okay so the amount of dissolved oxygen do the amount of dissolved oxygen in decreases if the amount of ammonia in the water increases so which causes the increase in biological oxygen demand so if the biological oxygen demand is increasing the amount of oxygen present in the water decreases obviously there is no oxygen present for the aquatic animals to survive aquatic life to survive so that is how this ammonia presence of ammonia pollutes the water so how can we treat them what needs to be done it am okay so particularly if you see the emona case the sewage of unsewered communities throughout the river particularly in ariana spanipat and sonipat districts so there are several industries located distilleries and dye plants located which are responsible for the increase of ammonia in the emona river and what needs to be done how to tackle this problem so if you see the treatment one thing is uh, if suppose there is ammonia polluted water if there is a ammonia polluted water sorry nh3 polluted water is there you can add fresh water to this so that the amount of means dilute to make it dilute but this is not practically possible so other uh, solution is chlorination chlorine can be added to the water so chlorination is a process of adding the chlorine compounds such as sodium hypochlorite and so on so it also kills the bacteria and other microbes in the water however uh, so this is how we can treat the um, ammonia affected water but to some extent chlorine is not much suggestible because high amount of chlorine is also to some extent toxic so that's why we have to go for some long term solutions these are short term solutions the long term solution is how to stop the pollution that is the preventing the discharge of dangerous materials into river how to be strictly implemented and uh, treat treatment of all the sewage before they go and mix into drinking water and make mix uh, this is very very important one maintaining the ecological flow all the rivers have 
द ग्रेट कैपेसिटी विच इज कॉल्ड एज सेल्फ प्योरिफिकेशन दे कैन गो मीन्स ऑल द रिवर्स कैन प्योरिफाई देम जेल्स इफ यू मेंटेन द इकोलॉजिकल फ्लो सेल्फ प्योरिफाई देम जेल्स बट इफ यू कुड नॉट मेंटेन द इकोलॉजिकल फ्लो देन वॉट हैपन्स इज द the self regulation or the self purification process of rivers does not occur and it becomes more and more polluted so what is ecological flow ecological flow is nothing but a minimum amount of water that should flow throughout the river and throughout the year to sustain the underwater and estuarian ecosystems and human livelihoods and self regulations right so this is the minimum ecological flow then what are the challenges <coughs> if you see the challenges here it is a blame game i can say it is a blame game so blame game so delhi is blaming the haryana and haryana is blaming the delhi so several times they approach the courts as well for justice so haryana is responsible for the 70% of the pollution and delhi water needs so haryana is a large agriculture population country and it is facing its own water scarcity but both states are fighting over the maintenance of the as i said ecological flow constant flow or ecological flow for amuna river is 10 cubics so both states have gone for court so they are fighting each other they are blaming each other for the pollution and for non maintenance of the ecological flow so this absence of minimum ecological minimal ecological flow and other contam addition of other contaminants is resulting in the uh, pollution of the amuna river so what is happening see this is again one more point to remember that is after the water is collected from the river for treatment in north east delhi the untreated sewage and the rubbish from the houses run off from the water drains effluents and unregulated industry flow all are again getting into the amuna uh, river which is again increasing the problem and multiplying the problem okay so here you have to remember how the ammonia content in the water increase in the ammonia content in the water results in the pollution of the water and not results in the decreasing of the availability of the drinking water because even the treatment plants delhi treatment plant or delhi water supply whatever the treatment plants are also not able to purify it completely it is very difficult and slow process slow process that is why the government cannot provide a continuous water supply to the uh, public right so and how the addition of ammonia to the water decreases the amount of oxygen do do present in the water and how it increases the biological oxygen demand and how it makes the water toxic to the fishes and also to the human right so this is the uh, main thing you have to remember so in the ecological context okay so moving to the next topic about the interstate river water disputes act of 1956 so the context is the telangana government has asked the ministry of jal shakti so mr k ksr so he went to delhi to refer the telangana's complaint in the inter according to the section 3 of this act to the krishna krishna water tribunal krishna water tribunal second krishna water tribunal and uh, it is also known as brijesh kumar tribunal as it is headed the chairman is brijesh kumar so as soon as possible telangana's fair and equitable share of the krishna water is expected to be finalized okay <coughs> right so coming to the discussion what is all about these uh, river water sharing disputes interstate river water sharing disputes if you see the con- uh, constitutional aspects and other aspects so these are the most contentious issues many of the states are involved in the uh, river water sharing disputes uh, re, uh, there are many cases like kaveri water dispute satlej yamuna linking canal dispute so that's the reason why there are various interstate water dispute tribunals established so to deal the problems like uh, we have ravi and bs narmada krishna vamshadara so there are major these are major interstate river disputes and there are uh, uh, dispute resolution mechanisms tribunals have been appointed on such disputes if you see the constitutional provisions coming to the constitutional provisions uh, this particular water okay water is a state subject 
okay the it you will find water in the state list saying that water supply irrigation canal drainage embankments water storage and water power all these are comes under the state list whereas if you see the union list union list the union government uh, is empowered to regulate and develop the interstate rivers okay it, uh, about the interstate rivers interstate rivers it can regulate and develop and also river valleys to extend declared by the parliament okay in public interest so water in general is a state subject where it will have the power over supply irrigation canal drainage embankments storage and water power whereas the union government is empowered to regulate and develop interstate rivers and uh, river valleys interstate rivers and river valleys can be developed by the central government to the extent declared by the parliament in public interest but this article 262 is very important here uh, in this context why because article 262 says that the settlement of interstate water disputes must be done under these two points that is <coughs> must be resolved by any legislation enacted by the parliament it is it must be resolved by the legislation accordingly so by following these points only parliament enacted this 1956 act and the second point says that no courts including the supreme court okay no courts shall have the jurisdiction over such disputes <coughs> so these are the two points mentioned in article 262 so according to these two points under the provisions of these two points government is taking the actions like this so according to the provision of 262 uh, article government passed this act legislation that is river board legislation and inter state water disputes uh, legislation of 1957 and river boards are established under the this uh, legislation to supervise the regulation and development as i said regulation and development is the <coughs> central subject is part of central subject union list so this board will do the same act and also federal government can ad hoc tribunal do remember ad hoc tribunal is a temporary tribunal formed to solve a particular dispute for example krishna tribunal 1 was a ad hoc tribunal the life of i mean it has been ended now it no longer exists krishna tribunal 1 now krishna tribunal 2 exists it is also ad hoc once the problem is solved this will no, no longer exist so ad hoc tribunal is a temporary tribunal and it says that the tribunal's decision is final and binding supreme court shall not involve in such uh, jurisdiction so that is how this tribunal uh, has been established but the problems are also there with this particular act if you see mechanism you have done interstate water tribunal so according to this act according to this act it says that any state government any state government uh, can request the uh, central government regarding any water dispute okay which cannot be settled by negotiations so if suppose a water dispute is there and if it is if this particular is not possible okay between uh, two states between two states there is a water dispute two or three states or four states but negotiations are not possible okay negotiations are not possible the solution is not being reached with negotiations then the states can request the central government to form a tribunal okay to form a new tribunal to solve this particular problem okay water dispute the act was amended in 2002 uh, to include some of the recommendations of sarkaria commission which says that okay so here we are giving more discretionary powers to central government which is anti federal so here the cooperative federalism uh, there is a question of cooperative federalism so that's why two points are introduced that is first thing government central government has to respond for this request within one year that means within one year they have to form the tribunal and the tribunal also shall not take much of the time so within 3 years within 3 years the tribunal must decide the case however there must be there are, there have to be some other exceptions in order to uh, extend the 3 years period there are some provisions but in general the act says that within one year the central government must form a tribunal and within 3 years the tribunal must end the case that means decide final 
so <clears throat> as of now there are many active river water dispute tribunals like krishna water tribunal 2 mahanadi water tribunals mahanadi ravi and bees water tribunal vamsadara water tribunal so okay several active tribunals four or five active tribunals are there in india right now so the issues so if you see the what are the several issues is what are the problems the thing is so much delay is there one point the first point is delay so if the matter is referred to that particular board or that particular sorry tribunal they are taking years of time very means almost 10 years 15 years 20 years of time to resolve the dispute okay as several problems so lack of time limit as there is no lack of time limit so 2002 in 2002 there was amendment keeping some time limit but however this is not practiced practically okay so there is no time limit from adjudication as i said even though there is 2002 they introduced this is not practically being followed so that's why it is said that there is no time limit no upper age limit for the chairman or members so the work is being suspended sometimes just because of vacancy instead of recruiting someone they are just suspending the work that's why the reports are not being released in time so institutional framework is not proper that's why the reverse board act of 1956 has become a dead letter at least right so there are several problems and uh, one more thing it is said that it is said that very important it is said that the file the tribunal decision tribunal decision is final okay it is said that the tribunal decision is final but still there are some loopholes where we can approach the supreme court on the decision of tribunal saying that article 136 is there anyway special leave petition so special leave petition under article 136 can be used to approach the supreme court on the orders of tribunal and also article 32 can be used where the sir, saying that the judgment of the tribunal is violating the fundamental rights so keeping uh, saying this and attaching the judgment with fundamental rights it can be approach to supreme court so that's why so we have the issues whereas there is more water politics in india and authoritative water data is not there problem is uh, one more problem is no proper water data no reliable water data okay so the scientific approach was not proper so more research is required in collecting the water data so that is the reason why so much discretion is there in different stages of the process so which is again delaying the process and sometimes it is arbitrary decisions has been made so that is all about the interstate water disputes act of 1956 okay so do remember that what is this act and how far it is being implemented in india what are the problems of this act and how can you address such problems okay so next <coughs> moving to the next topic is uh, this topic is about sir chotu ram right so sir chotu ram he was born in 1881 and he is a great man he is a great man he is a farmer farming reform warming reform or we can say that he brought uh, so many reforms in indian punjab farming uh, which stood as an example and which were followed by the upcoming generations but he was well known politician in british indian punjab province he was a right punjab province mr uh, this uh, sir chotu ram uh, uh, you know that there was a f- uh, 64 feet tall statue inaugurated by prime minister Prime Minister Modi inaugurated a tall statue of this uh, uh, Chotu Ram in his native village in Haryana. So he belongs to Haryana. So present Haryana. So at that point of time, it, it was part of Punjab province. So Prime Minister inaugurated a tall statue as well in his remembrance. So right. So why? Why is so? He was always knighted. So he. So he is all. knighted so that is the reason why knighted in the sense this is the honor 
given by British government. Knighthood honor is given to this man who excels. If anyone excels in any particular field, then knighthood will be given to that person. Then he was he was he will be called as sir. Okay, sir Choturam. Okay, knighthood was given to Rabindranath Tagore as well, but however he rejected that letter of honor. So that is. Uh, so he was the founder of National Unionist Unionist Party. He founded a party, and he was very active politician. And more than that, more than that, he was a campaign for the oppressed classes. Okay, for the oppressed classes, particularly the farming classes. Okay, for particularly the farming labors. So all his actions, all his fights throughout his life, is for the betterment of the farming labors. and oppressed classes he was he empowered farmers in the pre independence era for getting pro farmer laws for example if you see these laws punjab relief indep indebtedness act of 1934 punjab debtors protection act of 1936 so it is like it freed so many farmers from the debt trap this act okay and at the same time debtors were given protection from the hands of money lenders and he restored the tiller's title to the land okay so he gave so modern concepts of debt settlement board and caps on interest basic fairness to the tiller all these were originated from the ideas of sir chotura he was called the father of bakra area because uh, uh, bakra dam was conceived by him way back in 1920s he was also originated of the concept of minimum compensation minimum compensation to the farmers for their produce so from where we are telling that minimum support price so the concept of minimum support price was first introduced by sir chotu ram in india okay so the concept now is evolved as minimum support price but at that point of time he said that there must be some compensation to the farmers for the expenses made by him so regard irrespective of its production so that's the reason why we can say that he is a great reformer in the agriculture sector so we can say that he is a great agrarian agrarian reformer so he introduced so many reforms in agriculture sector like protecting the farmers from debt trap protect protecting him in case of uh, from the clashes of money lender and giving the tillers title to them right so that's the reason why we have to appreciate and remember sir chotugram as a great politician great agrarian reformer and uh, from the area of punjab okay he even got knighthood also which is a proud we feel, we have to feel very proud uh, for this sir chotugram <coughs> okay and the final topic was about the poison pill defense this topic is uh, related to the economy if you see the context is like twitter has challenged the elon musk elon musk is the ceo of uh, tesla so twitter has challenged this elon musk bid to buy the twitter company for more than 43 billion using the corporate tool known as a poison pill right so how the thing is what is this poison pill let me explain uh, the concept of this poison pill defense first and then we will see what happens is if there is a company x if there is a company x and there is a bigger company y okay there is another bigger company called y what happens is uh, y wants to buy y wants to buy the company of x shares of x more amount of shares of x so y want to come y the company y bigger company want to subsume want to buy out this the x company okay so but x company is against this okay the company x is against this uh, so they don't want to get sold out to y so that's the reason why what they do is they will bring up their shares okay they will share their number of shares are there so what they do is already they there some shareholders are there for this company x so what they do is they allow the existing shareholders 
to purchase the additional shares at very discounted price okay so the x company has shareholders 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 shareholders for example already these 10 shareholders are there in x company they will allow these 10 shareholders existing shareholders to buy the new shares at a discounted price they will decrease the price and they will sell the shares to already existing shareholders at a discounted price making these shares not available for why or at least making the why not interested in company x because already the shares are being decreased the value of share being decreased no company will show interest to buy that particular company imagining or expecting that the shares of this mean the company is in losses or the share share value is getting decreased so the why company either will not show interest or the number of shares available for, for the Y company is also getting decreased because the available shares are allowed, I mean available shares are being bought only by the existing shareholders. So I hope the, the concept is clear for you. Here the a smaller company which is against the buying of means a poison pill is a defense tactic. It is a defense tactic utilized by this target company to prevent or discourage the hostile takeover so takeover attempt by the Y is discouraged by providing the shares at cheaper rate to already existing shareholders instead of giving this shares to Y company they are giving the shares to already existing shareholders at a very cheaper price right so that's the reason why uh, the takeovers for example these takeovers will not show much interest for the decreasing prices of the shares okay so that's how the takeovers with or get this uh, will make discourage right if you see present uh, context here twitter is twitter has challenged the elon musk bid to buy the company for more than 43 billion using the corporate dollars so this is a defensive strategy used by the boardrooms to stop the takeovers right so this concept generally started in 1980s where the executives want to avoid the buying of one company by another company or individual or a group okay and to avoid the corporate riders and aggressive acquisitions okay corporate riders and aggressive acquisitions were avoided by using the poison pill defense so it is a tactic for making the companies less attractive less enticing to the acquirer to the potential acquirer once the share value is getting decreased it will become less attractive less uh, enticing for the acquirer those who want to acquire right this is how you can avoid you can prevent the acquisition of your company by another company okay this is all for today thank you